out there. Um, today is Monday, June 3rd, and um, the Board of 80 County Commissioners is in session at 9 o'clock in the morning um, to go into day three of our department budget presentations. And we're really looking forward to the ones today. We have operations, and then following that, we'll have juvenile court services. Um, before we get going, though, do we have any changes to the agenda, Madam Clerk? <clears throat> okay, we have a change, so I'll need a motion. Yes, Madam Chair, I move to amend today's agenda to remove items three through six from the schedule of department budget presentations as all these departments and offices will be heard tomorrow afternoon beginning at 1 p.m. We're not going to try to do them all today. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, state aye. Aye. Aye, the ayes have it. Uh, motion carries. Okay, any unfinished business? Don't believe so. No, then we're going to go ahead and take up new business. Um, we will start with Phil, who is emceeing yeah. these proceedings. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and good morning. As you already have noted, uh, today, after two full days of budget hearings, after two full days of budget hearings last week, we've kind of paced ourselves for this week. So we've got a series of half days that we'll be hearing budget presentations. Just as a reminder to the board, this is an excellent opportunity as departments are presenting to ask questions. This will probably be the most thorough dialogue that you have during the proceeding. Not that we won't be able to go back for questions, but this is an excellent opportunity uh, to engage with uh, elected officials or department heads uh, throughout the week. Also, as a reminder to members of the audience and those presenting, uh, we are streaming live today on the Ada County YouTube channel. So also, uh, all of this is being archived on our YouTube channel for members of the public. If you aren't able to watch it live, you can go back and watch any of the proceedings uh, going back. Um, and as you already noted, this morning we will be hearing from our uh, Director of Operations as well as our Director of Juvenile Services um, and kind of proceed from there. And I think with that, Madam Chair, we're ready for Kathleen to present on behalf of Operations. Let's just make sure we have on the record that all three commissioners are present this morning. Great. Okay, we're ready. All right. Kathleen. Kathleen. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. All right, Scott Williams is your Director of Operations and Billing Services. Operations is the county's centralized maintenance department that manages daily operation and maintenance for 25 facilities encompassing over 1,300,000, 1,300,000 uh, 1, uh, square feet. They also oversee all capital projects within the county, property leases, site certifications, and facility compliance issues. The operations department pays for most of the county's utility expenses, manages its energy conservation plan, the county's parking and alternate transportation program, and provides for the county's mail and distribution system. Billing services accounts for billing of refuge collection by the county's contractor within unincorporated areas of Ada County. They receive funds from customers, which in turn pays the contractor and other costs associated with this type of service. I'd like to now turn it over to Scott Williams, who will present the operations budget, and Lynn Call, who will present the billing services budget. And oh, you know what? I forgot to go over these. I'm sorry. It's Monday morning, isn't it? Yeah, it's Monday morning. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. So operations, they are a department within the current expense fund, 3% cap. Budget for FY20 submitted at $13,038,805, an increase of $479,000. Operating budget, uh, 9398901 Personnel budget, 3639904 This budget does include supplemental requests of $1,117,140. <clears throat> Below are the changes to the budget. Uh, they do have uh, personnel supplementals for seven new positions, maintenance mechanic, facilities, systems coordinator, two construction managers, an electrician, a painter, and I believe... There's another position that you can't see here. I'm sorry about that. I'm Carpenter. sorry? Carpenter. Thank you. And then four supplemental requests entitled uh, Myrtle, parking, uh, Myrtle Street Parking Garage, Carpet for the Courthouse, which is ongoing for two more years, and then uh, furniture fixtures and equipment for the new employees and new vehicles for the new employees. Billing services is in one of your enterprise funds, totally self-supported. Budget for FY20 submitted at $6 753,259, an increase of 832,922. Operating budget, 6,480,218. Personnel budget, 273,041. The changes are below. And then finally, we have the parking garage facility. This is one of your construction funds. 
This year, we had the 15 million um, that we put towards the parking garage for construction. Next year in FY20, they're requesting budget of 829,228. Uh, we've got fund balance to support that, and then there are some ongoing revenue streams that will also support that for additional funds for the parking equipment and the networking of the parking garage. And now I'd like to turn it over to Scott and Lynn, and I believe Lynn is up first, but I'm just gonna go ahead and put that up there. Thank you. Chair Kenyon, Commissioner Lasciando, Commissioner Visser, Clerk Murray, good morning. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to present the operations and billing services budget. And I will go ahead and turn it over to Lynn to explain the billing services. Billing services is an enterprise fund. Its budget is completely separate from the operations budget. So I'd ask Lynn to come on up and, and present her budget. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Lynn. How are you? Good morning. Uh, good morning, Madam Chairman, member of the board. Um, the primary function of Ada County Billing Services is to handle bill generation, payment processing, and customer service for residential and commercial solid waste service in unincorporated Ada County. We are responsible for maintaining an accurate and up-to-date service and billing database collecting and accounting for customer payments, and making sure the Ada County landfill and contract waste hauler are paid timely. The contract hauler for Ada County in the new budget year will be hardened sanitation. We currently bill approximately 530 commercial customers every month and 19,640 residential customers quarterly. We have two full-time and one part-time employees. We utilize various methods of automated payment processing to ensure the payments are deposited timely and financial records are accurate and meet audit criteria. You will note that the 2020 billing services proposed budget reflects an increase in both revenue and expense. Our budget is reflective of variations in the number of residential household and commercial accounts served and depending on the nature and compaction of waste being tipped at the landfill. New construction within the service area generates less compactable construction and demolition waste while in progress, and then adds to our residential weekly household waste removal as each residence is completed. Um, <clears throat> our budget is pretty straightforward. We did have a rate increase this last year, uh, a cost adjustment rate increase, so it wasn't an, a percentage across the board. It was to bring up each of the um, distribution levels to support actual cost and maintenance of the e-fund. And uh, so we did see a rather substantial rate increase to the customers last fall. Uh, this came after many years of no rate increases uh, when our uh, enterprise fund was starting to run low. Uh, I'll open up to questions at this time. Would you mind uh, just explaining the tipping fee, the offset by increase in transfer sta station usage? Okay. And uh, I think it's a credit of 405, 840. We've seen a, a substantial increase in usage of the transfer station over last year's budget, particularly because last year, um, one of the transfer station was, was offline most of the year. So this year, they are use, utilizing both the Boise and Meridian transfer stations. A lot of our waste is being diverted there instead of being hauled all the way up to the landfill. Uh, so we're paying more to the transfer stations, less to the landfill. Thank you. Madam Chair, um, a, a couple of questions here. Um, I know we have coming up some conversations um, amongst ourselves about uh, the orange bag program and what our options are. And just from a, a, a timing standpoint, we didn't have a chance to have that conversation before this. So I just want to make sure that reflected in this budget is the flexibility for us still to have that conversation about what's the best path forward for residents of unincorporated Ada County with regards to the orange um, bag. Yes, that has been included. I did include the possibility of the, the grant Mm -hmm. uh, and also expenditures associated with implementation of the Orange Bag program. Okay. And then the second question that I had, um, we re we're reflecting an increased population in unincorporated, but based on our recent conversations at Compass, our, um, generally our population levels, at least residential and unincorporated, is holding steady. So I don't know if this is 
increased commercial or, or what you're seeing there? But if you could give us some perspective well, on right those now numbers. I have a listing of over 100 pending closings on new constructions that we're just right. waiting to uh, fire off those accounts and start them activated. And that does not include all of the ones that we don't know about. Those are okay. just the ones that we've received reports from title companies indicating that closing is imminent. Okay. So is that the amount that's reflected in here? It is, and yes. Not any other projections? Well, we, we also uh, know that we've got a, if we've got 100 that we know about, we have at least 100 that we don't. Okay. At this point. So you're taking that into account? We are, yes. Okay. Great. All right. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Scott? Thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> Again, good morning to all. Thank you for this opportunity to present the operations budget. Ada County Operations is responsible for all new construction projects and providing safe and well-maintained facilities for Ada County departments and the public. The mission of Ada County Operations Department is to perform a cost-effective construction, maintenance, and repair procedures to ensure county facilities are safe, well-maintained, and energy efficient. Our staff is our strength. We provide the highest quality service in the most efficient manner. We trust and respect each other while working to support the overall mission of the 80 county elected offices, departments, and citizens. 80 county operations is made up of a staff of 48 personnel, administrators, administration, journeymen, maintenance mechanics, and mail clerks. We repair and maintain 1.3 million square feet of office space and buildings in and across the county. We repair and maintain parking facilities throughout the county, procure and manage contract services such as janitorial, landscaping, and security in county facilities. We're responsible for new construction and projects. We process and track utility bills, operate a fleet of 33 vehicles, manage employee parking in the courthouse corridor, and provide mail services for county departments and locations. So far this year, we have completed many projects, but here are a few of the larger projects. Carpet replacements. We've replaced prosecuting attorney's carpet in their central area, and both sides they have large cubicle areas that's been replaced. Clerk ordered a recorder, cubicle areas gotten replaced. We will be starting another project in there to replace the rest of the carpet back through and all the way around into the treasurer's office. Public safety building main corridors have been upgraded. Courthouse audiovisual system upgrades. We are ahead of our original schedule and gotten more systems upgraded than projected. This is in part to the board allowing us to take funding from FY18 prior to the end of the fiscal year and use it toward equipment for this, this project. The court, courts and the marshals have done a great job working with the courtroom schedules. This has limited our downtime and allowed our contractors to be able to get in and out and quickly, we've completed the following courtrooms, 201, 202, 203, 207, 400, 401, 410, 503, 504, and 510. We've completed tenant improvements for the clerk, auditor, recorder, and indigent. This project included new office space, conference room, and workout area for employees. The clerk, auditor, recorder, data, and electrical. This project was to install power and data in the new cubicles for the clerk auditor recorder area. The building, building the database for the facility maintenance management system is ongoing. The maintenance system is operational at the public safety building. We are currently expanding it into other county facilities. Courthouse access design project is in design. Sheriff's Office Fence Camera and Baller Project is in design. AD County Sheriff's Office Property Evidence Refrigeration Project design is complete. We're out to bid for that project. Courtroom 200 is in design. Good progress is being made on that design. We had a meeting just over a week ago to allow 
go over the progress plans and look at where we're at. And the fourth district court is very involved in that project, giving their input, so we make sure we're heading where they want to they want to go and want to be. Clerk, auditor, recorder, break room, public defender, tenant improvement is under construction. Framing is complete, windows are in, sheetrock has been installed, taping and texturing is underway. With funding approved by the board, we were able to complete several roof projects this fiscal year. FACES, Expo Idaho Large Animal Barn Structural and Roof, PSB roof sections five and six A are completed. PSB roof sections one, two, three, and three A will be complete before September, by September 30th. If not within the next month, they're really moving along, doing a great job. The weather has not really been cooperating very well with us. The public safety building Roof electrical feeder and communications project is complete and closed out. This had to happen before roof section five could be completed and it's also done, so make good progress there. Public safety building grounding and bonding. The ground ring is complete, at the, almost complete at this time for phase one. Much of the operations budget is dedicated to the items that are on this slide. Repairs, preventative maintenance, facilities maintenance management system and the remaining facilities, inspection of fire, life safety equipment, elevators, boilers, HVAC. Major upgrades have been completed to the public safety building generator. This generator has been in the facility since it was constructed. Janitorial services, landscape services, security. Parking costs for the diamond lot at Avenue A and, and Myrtle will be increased by $12,000 annually. Operations absorb this within our budget. Madam Chair. Uh, Scott, can I ask a question? And it's um, it may be a question for you and and Kathleen. Um, so parking components are coming out of this budget. Um, I know ACHD. I've had a conversation with Clerk McGrain, um, or excuse me, the Ada County um, helps support um, the opportunity for people to take ACHD commuter ride. Where in our budget d is that reflected? Does do we? Where would I look for that, Kathleen? That, that's also in the operations budget. Selena takes care of the, the all that stuff with ACHD and, and getting the passes and getting everything set up with that. So that's in the operations budget. Okay. So I would love to see some detail that really compares um, what the costs are for a person, for an employee to park versus what their costs are to take ACHD commuter ride because I'd really love us to be able to set up some incentive if possible um, for folks to be able to ut utilize that service. And that might be an additional uh, offline conversation, but um, you know, ultimately that obviously sure. saves people time on the roads, but also saves us having to continue to expand parking yes. options. Selena works on the van pooling and the bus rides and, and people that carpool, and so we can certainly get you that information. Okay. And I guess the question I have for today would be if we need to sort of change that model, I, th I believe it's currently more expensive for someone to ride through the commuter ride than it is for them to pay to park. I'd like to see us sort of reverse that. Um, it may be that that's something we'd want to look at within this budget. Okay. okay. So just a quick question on major repairs. I know that generator um, is aging. It is. What would be the cost if um, we, at the end of its life cycle, and we need to replace the generator this year? Uh, depending on who I talk to and what we're looking at, we're probably looking at somewhere in half a million dollar stage and we're not even sure that the generator can be put back in the same place that it's in. I get conflicting reports from it's currently in the basement of the public safety building and getting it in, getting it out and whether we can put it back in there or not is we'll take an engineering study and we need to take a look at that. For the cost of the repairs that we did, it made more sense to do the repairs to the generator. We should probably get at least another, I would say five years out of the generator. So it gives us time to look at that and start planning toward that. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, sewer costs are expected to rise with newer and tighter federal regulations and with major upgrades to the Lander Street water renewal facility. We anticipate a 7% increase in annual, or sorry, 7 <coughs> annual increase for the foreseeable future. The ongoing construction boom is making getting bids for smaller projects difficult. Some of the projects we bid, we get one person, one bid, and maybe somebody, nobody shows up for them. So it is, getting, it is getting harder. 
good quality workmanship is getting harder to get without consistent overseeing of the, of the contractors. Many of our existing systems are at the end of life. HVAC, automation controls, the AV systems, security cameras. Many of them require updating. In some cases, the systems will no longer work and are no longer supported and will not work with the latest versions of computer software. Parts are less locally available, and if we are available at all for the systems, we have to order them in and wait for parts. So Scott, my understanding is um, with the new software that we have, Dude Solutions, <laughs> um, we'll be able to enter all of this in, hopefully this year, this coming year. As we build the database, we'll have more and more information, and it will give us projections on costs and when things need to Timing, be replaced. Timing, costs, all Timing of that. and costs. And, and that, Mike and I were just looking at that the other day, yeah. and we look at the projected costs of when we started and how far out it's got to go, and we're starting to build those projections and looking at that. Okay, I know some of that's already built into your budget, but this will give us a much more accurate view of that. Thank you. All of these systems will need to be upgraded or replaced sooner than later. To meet operational needs and county growth, we've requested seven new personnel for FY20, as listed on this slide. The first is a maintenance mechanic for the Myrtle Street Garage. Ada County has recently entered into an agreement with River Caddis for the development of a four-story, 400-place garage that's approximately 131,600 square feet with four floors of apartments above. Now, the apartments have nothing to do with, with Ada County. It'll, it's a separate, be a separate condominium um, unit. Ada County will be responsible for the maintenance, repair, and cleaning of the parking structure and lobby areas. We are requesting an additional maintenance mechanic to maintain the garage and associated grounds and planters. At this time, we're anticipating the garage will be ready for use in June of 2020, according to their current budgets. That may get pushed out a little bit further. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Scott, so we um, are essentially condoing out a certain number of um, parking spots of, over the larger piece. Um, how does that look, our maintenance mechanic versus what the developer is needing for their portion of the garage? Can you sort of talk me through that? Are, are we responsible for all of those garage units? Are they going to be helping to subsidize that? We are responsible for the maintenance and, over, and care of the entire parking garage. The tenants of the apartments will be charged the going rate monthly for their parking spaces. Okay, and have we run some kind of analysis in terms of what uh, financials will be bringing in? Um, how much will be coming in to support that from the, um, from the tenants? Um, I don't, I, I think we ran it prior to now, but up until here recently, we haven't had a total count on the, the apartments but that is something that we can do with going rates or somewhere in the $130 a month range. Or if we did it before, if you could send me that, have somebody send me that, I'd okay. appreciate it. Take a look at that. Scott, are the construction managers going to be permanent positions or are they in your budget this year because of increases in new construction? Uh, they would be permanent construct, they would be permanent positions unless everything dropped off to where we didn't have anything for them to do. We have a lot of internal smaller projects that wind up taking a lot of time um, on Bruce's side, my side, and Mike, our maintenance supervisor for that, man I'm sorry, maintenance manager, uh, to look at that stuff. Carpet projects, they all eat up a lot of time. So they would be, they would be permanent positions. Madam Chair. Mr. Visser. Uh, thank you. Uh, Scott, with uh, this request for two construction managers, what's the current status of construction managers and, and how are they assigned? Uh, for instance, smaller projects, short-term projects, longer-term projects. Uh, so Small projects, in-house projects that we try to do. Mike has been doing a lot of that and hoping to shift some of that and get him so that he can look at where our future needs are, maintenance, where our current needs are and what our future needs are for that. So that would help Mike out with that. Currently, we have one construction manager position. Uh, we hired a person for that position. That person gave us their resignation. We're out, to, we have a job opening. We have interviews set up right now to hire another construction manager at this point. We haven't had anybody in there for quite a while and it's, it shows um, on what we can actually get, get accomplished and get done because manpower is just stretched to, the, to its absolute limit at this point. 
<clears throat> so funding for the Myrtle Street garage for six months for an, an employee for that would be 27,000. 970 with a total cost of 55,937 ongoing. Facility services coordinators, next one on the list. As you're aware, um, Scott, we have, I'm sorry, before we move on, go ahead. Um, going back, and I'm not saying facility dude software just to say dude software, but um, <laughs> I love the name. So I'm looking at administration, it says maintenance of the software. So is that 45,000? Walk us through that. Is that just is that the maintenance that we can expect every year, that, or is that that's an ongoing cost for all of our facilities covered under that one maintenance service agreement? One agreement. Thank you. Okay. We are expanding that that system to additional sites. The position of the facility services coordinator was discussed earlier with the board. We have kind of moved one of our people into that position, filled it internally. Once a maintenance mechanic position is what was vacated, we'll be hiring another one for that one. This one gets approved. The employee currently doing the work for this position is very detail oriented learning quickly and doing a wonderful job. Their job is to work with our maintenance mechanics and journeymen, build an effective process and procedures for preventative maintenance and repairs for various equipment throughout the facilities. Total cost for that ongoing will be 55964 The construction managers, as we discussed, uh, we've asked for two construction managers. The number of projects and the complexity has grown. Bruce, Mike, and I each spend a lot of our time overseeing construction projects and implementing improvement projects. This workload makes it difficult to run the operations department. Two additional construction managers would pick up the project load for both small and large projects. This would allow Bruce and I to focus on the running of the department and Mike to focus on the maintenance and current future needs of the county. Ada County has experienced a major growth period as a result. There are expansions and facilities in the planning and construction stages. New facilities are needed and will be coming online in a, in a not too distant future. Operations will need to have the staff ready to oversee these projects, finish and be involved in the transition from construction to the maintenance phase. Two additional construction managers will allow us to do that. This would let Bruce and I get back to running the department and look at the county future needs and growth and oversee the construction process as needed. Scott, um, in terms of the, the salary amount, is that competitive? How did you arrive at that amount based on um, what you mentioned currently or that the, the market is, as we know, really hot right now, and it's really tough to recruit and retain folks. It, it is. It is. And I, I think we're, you know, we're relatively competitive. Um, I think the prices, you know, the costs for the positions are, are there. We had some really good applicants the last time. We've got some this time. So, yeah, I think, I think, we're, I think we're right in the ballpark with where we're at. So. The cost, total cost for both these positions would be $189,724. Electricians, due to the security aspects of our facilities, outside contractors have to be accompanied while they're inside our facilities. A second journeyman would allow us to reduce the need for outside, con to, I'm sorry, to escort uh, outside contractors. An additional electrician would allow for better in-house troubleshooting, upgrades, and repairs that require a journeyman electrician. Repairs and replacement of electrical components can be tracked with the facility's maintenance system. Total cost for this position, 68801 The painter, we... Uh, question, what's the current status of how many electricians we have and whether they, they float or they're assigned to locations? We have one electrician currently on staff and he goes to every place that we can to get, this, get the work done. If we have the option to, anytime we can, if we have the option to contract something out, and keep him busy working on inside stuff, we'll have contractors do stuff that they don't have to be as supervised on inside of our facilities and our buildings. So we do contract out work. And do you have an idea of uh, the lag time if a request is put in for electrical work by, via our staff electrician? Uh, is he running behind schedule significantly or slightly or what's He's what's going He's on? very busy with the workload that we currently have. Uh, that we have a, we have panels that need to be upgraded. We have a lot of things that we would look at 
getting another person to do and get con or, and or contracted. So yes, he's very busy and we are still contracting out work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So have you done an analysis on the cost savings that the county would see in hiring an electrician in-house versus continuing with the outside contracting? I, I can't say that I have, but I know it would allow our maintenance staff to get back to doing maintenance work where many times we have to escort the contractors through to get the stuff done. So we can certainly look at that. Madam Chair, um, I would echo that. That was the same question I was going to ask. I know it's really challenging for your employees um, when we have to you know, work with folks to get into the jail or the co courthouse or wherever it may be because of security issues, but I think it would be helpful for us to see that analysis of how much we're spending um, in, in staff time and quantify that uh, versus hiring an electrician who wouldn't have, or a painter or whomever, who wouldn't have to have that kind of um, escorting needed. Okay. We'll have to look at that because I'm not 100% I'm not sure how well we've tracked that portion of this. It's just people show up and we've got to get them in the building. So we will definitely get some well, numbers certainly on that. have the hard cost though, the hard cost of the contract labor versus a fully yes. loaded employee yes. over, yeah, over time. I'm more kind of in the same place with our painter. We currently have one painter for all the county facilities. Our maintenance staff works hard to try and keep up with painting, but we currently ha do have a backlog of painting and refinishing jobs. Our facilities, especially those at the courthouse, 400 Benjamin, jail, juvenile, are very high traffic buildings. If we hire an outside contractor, we would need to have one of our security personnel with them. Again, we do contract things out that are exterior of the building outside. We don't have to stand there and keep an eye on them. Another full-time painter would allow us to schedule work with departments and offices as needed to allow our facilities to be kept in better condition overall. The cost for that position would be 51807 As our facilities age and get, get older, we need, they take more maintenance. In many cases, that requires more staff. To help minimize staff requirements, we, contract, we do contract out projects. But given the security constraints as we've discussed, we have to provide staff to get contractors in and out. The carpenter position would really help limit this and allow us to do small projects in-house and free up our maintenance staff to go back and do maintenance and work orders. Large projects like construction, carpet installation, alarm testing, and other system repairs are done after hours to minimize weekend and interruption, or on weekends to minimize any interruptions. Having personnel on staff to do work in-house, we can use our time more productively. A carpenter would allow to do small projects in-house while freeing up our maintenance staff to do maintenance and other requests. The carpenter position would reduce the need for outside escorts again on smaller projects and allow for more efficient scheduling of work. Total cost for that position is 60,627. Our total supplemental request for PBS for employees is $482,140 as an ongoing expense. I'll now go through our supplemental, our supplemental request through, through FAB. <clears throat> this isn't the parking garage, it's separate. This is still part of your operations budget. The parking garage is, yes, the parking garage is, is separate. Um, this will be in our budget, but what you're looking at, what you're looking at here. What we did ask uh, for access to for the parking garage is the fund balance that is in the fund for that garage, which was $829,228, so that we can get the uh, parking systems installed, we have fiber optic that's gotta get into the building, uh, and the operation and installation of all the parking gates and the access control system and cameras. So we've asked for, we've asked for funding, we asked for access to that funding, and that's been set up so that we can access that during the construction phase so we can get those items put in. So the Myrtle Street parking garage, um, as we previously mentioned, we have an agreement for a, a four-story, 400-place parking garage on the corner of 3rd and Myrtle. Ada County be responsible for the maintenance and utilities and operation of the parking area and associated grounds and cleaning of the parking structure. This request 
indicates the total for one year operation. So the board will, I wanted the board to understand what the total cost of the facility was. At this time, the developers anticipating the garage within one year of start. Draft schedules indicate that could be as early as June 2020. Our expenses would be limited to four months or less in FY20. Requested funding for this annually is $221,000 as an ongoing expense and would be subject to change, the change in utilities or any other costs. Funding for this position would be $73,667. Scott, is the security contract, is that, um, are we bearing the full cost of that or is that being cost shared? The security contracts? No, the security contracts, we would have security going over there just to do the four floors of the apartment, not the uh, parking garage. We don't have anything to do with the security on the, uh, on the upper floors. So that would just be going through and keeping an eye on the parking garages as they're in the evenings and as people are getting off of work. Okay, thank you. Carpet project for Ada County Courthouse. While most of the existing carpet in the courthouse was installed at in time of construction in 2001, for the most part, carpet projects have to be done on after hours and on weekends. We replaced a lot of some of the carpet in larger areas and of the building as well as smaller areas of the offices. When we do large expanses of carpet, like long public and employee corridors and cubicle areas, doing them at one time will save money will look better than done all at one time than half at a time. Cost of carpet projects depends on the number of items that have to be moved to install a carpet. Areas like corridors, individual offices have fewer items to move, so they're less expensive. Cubicle areas take more time to relocate or lift, especially cubicles that have glass in them. Replacement of the existing carpet is the best option. In many cases, the carpet backing is separating from the carpet or so badly worn, nothing else can be done with it. We're requesting $150,000 with an ongoing into FY21, 22, so we can get the major parts of the building taken care of. Same amount for 21 and 22? Yes. Okay. Request number three is for furniture and fixtures for new employees. Operations requested seven new employees. We will need desks, computers, monitors, phones, and tools for those employees. Upon your approval, we're asking for $7,000 per employee. Requested funding for this is $49,000. We've requested five staff positions that will require vehicles for those employees to do their jobs. Below is a list of the vehicles needed. We have two for the construction managers. One for an electrician, one for Scott, a carpenter. Scott, let Jando has a question for you. Sorry. So when we can see that analysis, that includes um, what we're currently paying contractors and hopefully some kind of association of the folks who need to uh, accompany them. Um, this is also going to be really important for us to see as a part of what the life cycle cost would be for a new employee. So if you could include that in that analysis, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Again, upon your approval, the total request for funding for vehicles is $215,000. Are we leasing or purchasing these vehicles? No, we would be purchasing the vehicles. And when we look at what the cost of the vehicles are typically on state contracts and other contracts that are available to us, it's uh, there's no almost no point in buying used vehicles because of the cost differences. It's just not there. Plus, they're new. They've got a year warranty on them. Um, and we know, we know how long we'll keep them, that we've maintained them and where they've been. So there's some pluses of buying new. Thank you. CIP, Operational Expense Application Requests. This is a list of the Operation CIP and Operational Expense Application Requests. These requests were submitted through the CIP process. Transformation Board has sent their recommendations to the commissioners on all CIP and operational expense application requests. Courthouse security camera system. The existing camera system was installed in the courthouse at the time of construction. It has been in operation for 17 years. The system is no longer supported. It needs to be upgraded. Requested funding for this was $700,000. Courthouse server UPS, server room UPS and transformer replacement. The 
Current equipment was installed prior to 2001. Is, again, is no longer supported and must be replaced. The UPS maintains power to the servers in the courthouse until they can be properly shut down in the event of a power failure. If this system goes down, we will lose power to the servers. The request for this funding is $310,000. Juvenile security upgrade. Um, Scott, did we ever find out on the transformer here at this building if Idaho Power owns it or if we own it? We, own, we do own the transformer. I have asked Idaho Power to take a look at if it can be transferred over to them, if they can take it over and what that would take to have that happen. I did receive a call say, midday Friday. I did not get a chance to get back to our account manager. She asked me to call her referencing that. They have been out here to look at it. I don't have that answer back from them yet. They've been going through and, and doing an analysis on what they take to do that. Okay. Let us know. Okay. We'll get that. Thank you. Sure. The juvenile security system upgrade. This is to upgrade the existing security system to include but not be limited to camera upgrades, the addition of the cameras to the touchscreen system, upgrading the PLC control systems, and upgrading the existing computers that run the east and west control rooms. The requested funding for this was $350,000. Courtroom audio visual upgrades. The existing system was installed at the time of construction and they are no longer functional with today's technology. This has been an ongoing progress. Um, I'm sorry, this has been an ongoing project and we're making great progress on it. We will need funding for the next two fiscal years to complete the upgrades in all the courtrooms. Once this project is completed, we will have continuity and compatibility in all the courtrooms. Our requested funding is for $252,000. Scott, when, um, when you get a chance, could you just quickly go through um, the Transformation Board's priority uh, scoring of these projects where they land? Um, I'm afraid I did With not. That? I did not bring that with okay. me. On, I'm sorry. I believe the, P, the entry storefront was pretty low, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It was. And I, you know, I don't think that one's going to get funded. So, I mean, that one's going to be off the, off the table. At, um, that one was listed at $312,500, and it's, it, it, was, it was very low. Yeah, I'm just going through all the projects that we that we yeah, asked for. We'll go back and there. take a look so. at those yeah, scorings. Thank you. So we'll go to the next slide, Bruce. Operations applied for funding for three projects under operational expense. Public safety building jail and jail grounding and unbalanced load. This would be the second year with one more additional year requested. This project was started in FY19. Grounding and bonding issues were found during the jail security upgrade. The facility has been added on to multiple times. Several issues have been identified throughout the, con the complex. The ongoing funding will allow us to finish locating the cause and corrections of these issues that exist in the electrical system. Phase one, the grounding ring, is very near completion. We have found some additional issues and problems that are being taken care of in phase one also. There's some funding that's left, and anything that's left in it, we will put toward correcting any of the issues that come up. The requested funding for this ongoing would be $200,000. Scott, I'm just curious. I know these buildings, a couple of these buildings are really aging. <laughs> They're really getting up there. And at some point, continuing to um, do repairs. And uh, I know we have to do the maintenance on them, but the repairs and the remodeling and things like that you know, weighing that versus the cost of new construction. I'm just wondering at what point, and, and do we have um, numbers that show like the average cost of the repairs and remodels that we're having to do because of the age of the building? Are we tracking that so we could get that, just for example, the for the PSB building and for the juvenile court uh, systems building? We can go back through and look at what we spent for upgrades. Um, that's what the facilities management system is going to allow us to do so we can track every project and know where everything is in one place at one time and not have to glean through our entire budget to find out where that money was spent. Unfortunately, many times in the past, money was moved, money was moved around, and it's very difficult sometimes just to figure out where did that come from and what was it used to. We are doing the best that we can the last few years especially is to use the system that's in place for the budgeting and, and for writing purchase orders so it comes out of the foot line that it belongs in so we know what was spent out of those lines so we can track it better. And we have been working very hard to make all that stuff 
go where it belongs so we can follow it and track it. We so can do the best so we can to get, get you that information. Trying to get a historical perspective would be really difficult, but moving forward, we're going to be able to better track all of that. We're going to... The Public Safety Building in Ada County Juvenile Court Services HVAC control upgrade. The HVAC system controls, operates the entire heating and cooling system. Ada County is upgrading all their computers to Windows 10 platform. The system we currently have will not work on Windows 10. It will need to be upgraded. Without this system, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to maintain the heating and the cooling in those two facilities. The jail walk-in cooler freezer in the jail kitchen. This is another one that rated very low. I understand that. And we asked for $187,500. And as I have said before, we will do the best we can to maintain what's there and keep it going until we can fund it to get it replaced. It is up and going. It is functional. There are some things we have to take care of, but we will we'll do that. Madam Chair, Scott, um, is this the first year this has made it onto the Transformation Board list, or has this been an ongoing request that just hasn't No, this made? is the first year that we okay. put this on here because we're, we're seeing it's getting worse. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing it, so we just wanted to get it out there and everybody be aware of it. So Great. Thank you. Okay. So, it's, uh, Scott, are you working with um, Steve in IT and with Kathleen um, in regards to how we set up Dude Solutions so we can actually track a building? Because I know that money, like you said, it's being pulled from different areas and it's really hard to do that tracking. So I just want to make sure as we set that system up moving forward that we're able to capture individual buildings um, so we can really track the, the cost of all in costs. The program itself is, is set up by building and by complex on where they're at and what we're doing. We track everything that has to do with the equipment. We can put the money and the amounts in. Mark also is tracking our expenditures a completely different way. So we have, we know what's capital, we know what's been spent, we know what's been increased and what's been done. So we can go back and take a look at that, get that done. But yes, it's, the, it's, it's an off the shelf program, so it's already set up a certain way. We can we can modify that to some degree to get the information out of it that we want, but it will give us capital costs into the future is, is what we're hoping for and what we're looking for. Thank you. I'll go ahead and summarize the operations budget. Our personnel budget is $3,687,376. This includes additional personnel to meet maintenance and construction needs. Our operating budget is $6,773,593. Our capital budget is $2,625,308. Total operations budget is $13,086,277. This includes PBS and FAB supplemental costs Requests, I'm sorry, of $1,117,140. Again, I'd like to thank the board for your support and your time and consideration of this budget. I'll stand for questions. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate that. Any questions, Commissioner Visser? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, please. Uh, Scott, looking at uh, your first handout, the spreadsheet on the historical review of operations, um, there's no entries for grants, uh, neither for operating budget or personnel budget for the four years that are shown. Um, just flipping over to the next uh, presentation coming up, uh, juveniles, they have sought and received significant grant funding uh, to the tune of, it looks like, almost 25% of their personnel expenses. Uh, do you have anybody in-house that uh, searches for grants, and has there been applications in the recent history that you're aware of? Typically, with grant applications, they're left up to the departments that we are doing the work for. No different than what Tony got a grant to do the uh, public defender remodel that's going on now. And that's up to the departments, and we can work with them, and we can help them. Same thing was done for the portions of the bike path. We looked at getting grants for that. Um, Scott Kohlberg was and, uh, and our department worked together on those. 
So typically it's up to the department. Sheriff's Office got a grant through Homeland Security for the ballers and the cameras and the, and the fencing project. So the we, revenues are reflected in the individual department, but the expenses yes. are coming out of yours. The expenses would be moved into an account, and that money would come out of that line item for those expenses. Is what's happening with we're tracking it. with uh, the public defenders projects. We track the expenses and let them. If it's in a separate line item that they have to pay for, then we let them know that the applications for payment have been paid are okay. The work's been done, and they can go ahead and pay them. Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Maybe as a clarifying point for Commissioner Visser, um, comparing to juvenile, juvenile's funding is the SIG block grant money. Are they, it's not pursuing grants in the same manner that is being referenced here. So just as a distinction, also generally speaking, we aren't budgeting those grants, like other grants, if we get one. Uh, what we'll do is we'll open the budget during the fiscal year when we receive the grant funding and add that additional money in because of the unpredictability of grant funding. Um, we, we talked about last week in terms of you know, I think Commissioner Lanciando suggested how can we be more strategic, but that's a different approach than what we'll hear from Director Burns in terms of her grant funding. Did you have a question? Madam Chair, I, I think the, the point is well taken in terms of making sure we're being able to see across all of our departments and offices how these different pieces are either ending up in your budget or in theirs. So for example, uh, the coroner's office is applying for a grant um, I believe through the uh, Justice Department uh, for a the cooler uh, new cooler freezers and so but that's reflected in theirs versus some of these other versus your uh, department which has a significant number of transformation board um, projects so I guess I'm still a little bit confused as to how something's ending up in your budget to present versus uh, some of our other departments and offices. I worked, I worked with the coroner's office trying to get the information together for them. I don't know the operation of their department, what it takes to get that money, and what they need, uh, what their total needs are all the time as it comes through. They are aware of that. Again, if they get that grant, that grant gets, that money would get put into a fund that would be managed. We take a look at what the construction costs are. We approve the applications as they come through, and if it's up to them to pay it, or if it's up to us to pay it, or in the case of like Avamore, I, you know, Kathleen takes care of those. Mm -hmm. So the same, the same thing would, would apply. When we put in requests for our department, when we put in things that we see that we need, they are current building needs that are, that are there that we see that need to be taken care of and maintain the current facilities in the condition, in a better condition, improve those. And we see them and we put them in and ask for the funding for them in our, in our budget. So typically CIP projects that are new are coming out of a department or office, but ongoing maintenance, et cetera, is, is reflected in yours. Correct. Okay. That's, that's where we're at with those. Another question, please. Yes, Commissioner Visser. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm a proponent of using interns and externs because they're two-way beneficial. It gives uh, upcoming professionals uh, students the opportunity to uh, get on the job experience uh, mentorships can also uh, enhance their their career opportunities and, and then we have the opportunity of, of bringing on someone uh, either at a low salary or no salary if they have uh, college credits for their externing time um, do you have any externs uh, in-house right now and what has been your uh, policy on using externs, say, in the last five years? We currently have one. She just graduated. She's been working with Selena on the energy management and keeping all of her utilities up to date and looking at other ways we can save on utilities and being energy efficient. So we have one. We had one previous to her, so we, we have used them in, in that capacity. I would have to really look and see what else is out there that, would, that we could use and that would benefit our, with us. And that's one of the things that would allow us to sit down and go back through if we weren't so busy with the day-to-day -day operation of the maintenance or construction projects, it takes time to sit and look at those, those and see where we're going to go forward with them. And I would be very happy to take a look at that. It just, it all just takes time at this point. But we do currently, we do use one person right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anything else? All right then. 
All right. Thank you, Scott. Okay. Appreciate Thank you all time. very much. Hope you have a great rest of the day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Turn it over to Phil to guide us through this process. No, Madam Chair, we're scheduled for a break at 10.30, but I think the break is between uh, operations and juvenile. Maybe appropriate now, maybe take a break till 10.15. I'm assuming, and knowing Director Burns, she's more than prepared uh, to get going once we get back. You okay with that, Don? I am. Okay, great. All right, then, we'll take a recess. Board of 80 County Commissioners, we're back on the record for our department budget presentations, and it looks like next up we have... Um, Juvenile Court Services. And Phil, would you like to lead us through this? Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to Kathleen. Thank you. Juvenile is headed by Director Don Burns and operates in four divisions, Detention, Probation, Program, and Support Services Unit. The department strives to follow best practice and to offer evidence-based services. Detention, provides for the detainment, protection, and well-being of incarcerated youth while helping to ensure community safety. Probation provides comprehensive and collaborative supervision strategies focused on accountability, community protection, and skills development for youth in several areas of probation from diversion to community supervision. In addition, probation works with community partners, including schools and local law enforcement, to promote prevention and early detection intervention services. Programs provide statutory screenings and assessments for the court, substance abuse treatment services, mental health counseling, alternative school education for youth on probation, victim services and community service programming for juveniles to repay the community for their offenses. These programs foster youth and family growth, insight and rehabilitation relevant to the juvenile justice system. The support services unit is responsible for supporting the department's other three divisions and the director including the areas of budget and finance, training, limited personnel support, and budget analysis. The department works in conjunction with other partners, such as the prosecutor's office, public defender, courts, the state departments of health and welfare and juvenile corrections, and local law enforcement agencies and schools. Before you is a juvenile's uh, budget. They are a department within the current expense fund 3% cap. Budget for FY20 submitted for the county as $7,720,264, an increase of $340,486. Operating budget, $763,747. Personnel budget, $6,956,517. This budget for the county uh, does include supplemental requests of $338,429. Uh, and then uh, for their SIGIN block that was referenced earlier, $2,294. Below right in here, as you'll see, those are the numbers for SIG and block that were referenced earlier. Changes below, you'll see uh, they do have several supplemental requests for the general fund, two new positions for detention officers, three positions being requested to transfer from SIG and block. And then eight special salary adjustments for the block grant. We have two special salary adjustments, and there are no operating supplementals for this. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Don Burns, who will present the juvenile budget. Thank you, Kathleen. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Welcome also to our listening audience today. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, for your assistance, and I'd also like to thank HR, but they keep moving, so I'm never really sure uh, where, they, where they ended up. Um, my name is Don Burns, and I have the privilege of being the director of Ada County Juvenile Court Services, and I'd like to thank you today for the opportunity to present the department's fiscal year 2020 budget request, um, and I'd like to thank all uh, my staff as well who helped put this together. Well, it worked a minute ago, Madam Chair. There we go. Uh, I'd like to start with an overview of the department. Uh, we have 153 employees dedicated to carrying out the mandates of the juvenile court and having a positive impact on the lives of youth and their families. Uh, based on that number of employees, that makes us the fifth largest department in the county. Um, if you look at our funding combined, as Commissioner Visser alluded to, we have multiple funding sources. Uh, altogether, our budget is $9.4 million, which puts us at the 10th largest department based on budget. 
The difference in those rankings is because our service model is almost exclusively personnel based. That is the quality of the services we provide is based on the outstanding skills, education, experience, uh, and training of our staff. And as you can see from the chart, uh, probation supervised about 1,800 court involved youth last year, detention admitted 901 youth to the detention center. Our clini clinical and community services staff assisted about 800 youth. And um, in addition, just to call out, our probation staff also served 511 juveniles through our diversion program, which means these juveniles never touch the court system. Um, and at least most of them don't. So uh, we find that one of the best success of the department. Ah, this somewhat complicated chart with things going everywhere illustrates the service structure of our department and our relationship to the board and to the court, uh, fourth district court. Based on the statutory authority of Idaho Code 20-517, uh, the fourth district court contracts with the Board of County Commissioners to operate the Ada County Juvenile Detention Center on the court's behalf. Juvenile Court Services fulfills the operations oversight function for both the county and the court. This contract or operating plan, as it's called, also outlines other agreed, excuse me, agreed upon services provided to the courts, which are mutually beneficial to the county. As shown, Juvenile Court's three divisions are supported by our support services unit shown in green on the left. And I'd like to take a moment uh, Madam Chair, to introduce our new Budget and Finance Officer, Kelly Schills. Wave, Kelly. Thank you. Hi, Kelly. Welcome. Today is Kelly's first day. Oh, welcome. welcome. And we're very pleased to have well, her. Well, you should have her give the presentation, though. <laughs> that, talk about homework, Madam Chair. Um, our detention division, shown in yellow, is headed by Division Manager Terry Schaefer and is made up of 76 detention staff, which include four teams and a full service kitchen, as you know, and medical staff seven days a week. Our probation division in blue is headed by division manager Lael Hansen and is made up of 46 employees divided into six teams and organized by juvenile risk and geography. And finally, our programs division in Lavender is headed by division manager Jeff Schatz and is made up of clinical treatment, education, and community service programming with planning and victim services. The three division managers and I make up the leadership team of the department. These are our strategic anchors that are our guiding principles we use to make decisions. Safety and security of the youth, the staff, and the community are obviously our, at the foremost of our priorities. Further, we consider the needs of youth and their families, being good stewards of county resources, including our budget, and honoring our partners. And by the way, Commissioner Lachiando, for your tally of core values, our core values are doing what's right, balancing head and heart, and going above and beyond. The Juvenile Corrections Act, which guides juvenile justice in Idaho, is based on a restorative justice model that you see here. Restorative justice requires the justice system as a whole to address the needs of the community, victim, and offender by balancing community safety, competency development, and accountability. Juvenile Court Services provides, excuse me, Juvenile Court Services provides community safety by supervising youth in the community and, of course, secure detention when needed. We provide competency development by creating individualized treatment and probation plans, um, by providing opportunities to uh, regain missing school credits or earn GEDs, and to give back to the community through community service projects. And finally, we ensure youth accountability by enforcing court orders and following through with consequences for continued criminal behavior. And of course, we cannot do our jobs in a vacuum. We are grateful for the collaboration and strong relationships with our county partners, as Kathleen mentioned. Uh, but we also have many community partners as well. I'd like to highlight just a few. Probation works very closely with our school resource officers to help monitor juveniles, uh, particularly compliance while they're in school. 
We work closely with any school interested in partnering with us, including uh, we have a probation officer stationed at Boise uh, School District's Alternative High School, Frank Church, and that officer works to support at-risk youth for, to help them be successful. Division Manager Lael Hansen is an active member of the state interagency governance team, which is tasked with improving and coordinating uh, juvenile mental health services across the state. Our community service program partners with the Department of Labor's job service program to improve life skills for juveniles. And our detention center has a long standing agreement with local law enforcement, which allows an officer to drop off a low risk juvenile, such as a, a runaway, at our detention center on what's called a four hour hold, so they're not actually booked into detention. That allows the officer to get back on the road and then our staff contact parents and take care of that work so that the officer can be doing their job. Madam Chair, uh, Director Chair. Burns. Um, I know that's both an opportunity as well as uh, Hayes House is frequently utilized. What do you see as sort of the interplay between those two? Are there different kind of situations where folks are coming to you versus Hayes or, or what do you see? Madam Chair, I, I guess I can't speak to how often police officers use Hayes House. Um, my understanding is that some of those services have been limited, but we certainly could get back to you on some information. Okay. I know uh, through some work I was doing last year that um, there was some work to try and increase the use of Hayes House to make it more... Um, just make it easier for law enforcement to utilize that opportunity, which would certainly um, alleviate, if, the, if we can continue to work on that, alleviate some of our resources being used over at Juvenile. So I will, we'll have that offline. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner, yes. John, I have a quick question for you on the four-hour holds. Yes, is that an internal process that we have, or is that um, a statutory code uh, in the state code? Madam Chair, that's a courtesy that we provide to the law enforcement community. It's part of a longstanding arrangement. Uh, when juveniles come into detention, we, uh, through an agreement with law enforcement, perform an assessment called array, and that gauges the risk level of the juvenile as they come in. And the agreement is that detention, gen the officers will generally honor that, so that, for example, if a a uh, juvenile comes in and they're low risk enough to go back out into the community, the law enforcement officer will agree not to charge uh, that juvenile. Uh, occasionally they can override, but that was part of the original agreement when we put that ray into place, which keeps juveniles who don't need to be there out of detention. Is, does this count um, towards your statistics that you're gathering on your diversion program, or is this separate? This is separate, Madam Chair. These folks would not be necessarily considered court involved at yeah. this point. Okay. Thank you. But they may end up, let me finish, I'm sorry, but they may end up in a diversion program depending on how the prosecutor decides to move forward. Okay. Sounds like a good program. Okay, thank you. Okay, to move on to our FY19 accomplishments, uh, I'd like a, again to thank the Board of County Commissioners for your support and generosity. Our accomplished this year uh, were many, but just to highlight a few. With your support, we completed implementation of career paths across the department and so across all three of our divisions. Uh, probation programs and detention employees can now pursue growth opportunities that will help them progress through a career path. With the assistance, and I'll talk a little more about that as we go on. Uh, with the assistance of uh, our operations department, we have started construction on a safer entrance to our Benjamin Probation Office. Um, this will allow clients and families to conduct business with the front desk, such as making a payment without ever actually entering the probation office. This will increase staff safety, and as, a, as you are aware, at that Benjamin facility, there's a lot of pedestrian traffic that accidentally come into the office that, that will cut down on that as well. Um, the funding for this particular project actually came through our SIG uh, grant funds. So, that is not, that's one of the reasons you didn't see it in Scott's budget. Yeah. Uh, with your support, we have completed the first phase of probation supervision training called EPICS. I know you've seen that come across your desk. This training was developed by the University of Cincinnati and is based on current best practice uh, for effective, efficient, and client-focused approach to probation supervision. 
So tuning that up. John, are we able to do um, T3 training on this, train the trainer, so we pay for it and then we can continue to you know, use our own internal subject matter experts? Thank you for that question, Madam Chair. You should be seeing that voucher come across your desk oh. uh, in the next week or so. We are doing train the trainer starting, uh, I believe it's a month, I'd have to find out. But yes, that is our next phase so that we can continue this on and ensure that it goes on. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Ah, commissioners, to continue with our achievements, you've seen this chart before. Um, it represents the department's ongoing review of all of our existing services for compliance with current best practice and identifying gaps in service. The gaps are shown in white. Juvenile Court Services has a long history of basing our operations on accepted best practice. Over time, best practice changes, however, and so things need to be tuned up once in a while, and so that is part of our goal for the next, it's a multiple year process. This is part of our goal for that, and uh, Commissioner Vis Visser may remember that some of the things on this chart uh, were in white, but you gave us funding for that last year. Um, currently, the department is reviewing these continuum of services. Um, one of our accomplishments this year has been the review of our detention programs. You recently approved instructor training for a specialized exercise and mindfulness program designed for victims of trauma. Uh, that came out of this uh, review. Um, we are, we're also looking at strengthening our life skills curriculum based on this review. Uh, when we spoke to the board last year, we identified a gap in services to help families find community programs uh, after the youth returns from a long-term placement. Uh, you board gave us that opportunity for that program and we have a community, uh, <laughs> sorry, let me remind what that is, community resource specialist to meet that need and that person is on board and we're gearing up to start doing, uh, providing those services to families. And then moving forward, we are now beginning to review the services that we offer for court-involved programs and uh, we ha are setting up a meeting with the courts to review those, uh, what we do offer now. So we are moving forward in our continuum. Don, how are the groups in the schools funded? What do those consist of in the prevention category? I'm sorry, say that again? Um, in the prevention category, it says groups in schools. Can you explain what type of um, intervention um, or prevention uh, is taking place and who's providing those services? Thank you, Madam Chair, yes. Our probation officers have uh, really great partnerships with the schools. We provide girls circle and boys circle in the schools. We provide uh, training in the schools and at uh, just on you know law and, and, and ways to interact with the classroom uh, and particularly at that age group where, where kids need to hear that. And then also uh, just because we understand at the for prevention we understand that reading is such an important part of keeping kids out of the criminal justice system it's been shown with research that it, it is just key uh, we do actually have some of our probation officers in schools doing working with reading programs as part of that do we have any foundations in our community that address this particular practice of providing this wonderful education in the schools that we can partner with Madam Chair, I, I am personally not aware of any, but I bet my people are. I could sure get back to you on that. I know of a really great program in a community. It works really well if you guys would like to take a look at a model. Uh, absolutely, Madam Chair. Are we okay? All right. Each year, the leadership team develops budget goals in line with our plans for the year. Our top budget goals this year are to ask you to continue to support our career paths across the department and to help us address compliance with federally mandated detention staffing ratios. Before I address our budget request, however, I'd like to say a few words about our unique funding sources, uh, as Commissioner Visser mentioned earlier. As you can see from the graph, about 80% of the department's funding comes from general funds for a total of about 7.4 million. The remaining 20% comes from state pass-through funding and through grant funds, including the Detention Clinician Grant, the Juvenile Corrections Block Grant, and the Cigarette Tax Funds. These funds are used to support, as you mentioned, Commissioner Visser, 32 positions, which is about 
20% of our staffing, and I'd like to repeat that again, 20% of our staffing comes from funding that is not county-based, it's through the state. Um, the challenge with that is with that many staff relying on state funding is that we wish to maintain a reserve uh, in case the funding is reduced or eliminated, and we have had that discussion with you. We met with the auditor's office a few weeks ago and came to an agreement on a plan to do that. And based on that plan, we've withdrawn our request to transfer those three positions from grant funds to general fund. Um, I believe on the chart that Kathleen has, it shows up as about 220,000. So that amount would go away then. So we're still funding that through our, through our grant funds. Okay, Madam Chair, um, just rejogging my memory here, um, one of the challenges that we're having, um, a, a good challenge is that uh, Folks are smoking less, so we have less uh, cigarette tax funds coming in. Um, however, we are seeing an uptick in vaping, certainly. Um, and one of the concerns from a youth perspective is that sort of a gateway to regular smoking. And we've talked about potentially working with IAC to um, include vaping within that cigarette tax. Uh, one of the things we're hearing back from IAC, however, is that that um, somehow the cigarette tax may be targeted for med Medicaid funding, which of course, is also very important, um, but I wanna make sure we aren't uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. So it would be great. I don't think IAC is seeing this um, because most counties don't receive, obviously, as much funding as we do through cigarette tax. So love to see some analysis. If you could send us a one or two pager that we could share with them in terms of what we've been seeing over time. Um, so before some of those discussions happen uh, through the interim committees about uh, Medicaid funding. Madam Chair, Commissioner, uh, be happy to do that. Uh, just as a reminder, as I think you're aware, that funding source is uh, the cigarette tax funds and the uh, uh, tobacco tax combined, we used to call them cigarette tax for short, uh, are the fifth, is the fifth largest funding source for the mm -hmm. state. And currently, I think there are eight different things they're funding out of it. Uh, they just retired the capital funding from that source. We are the only county uh, source of funds going through there. So as a department, we obviously have concerns, although we have no uh, indication at this point that those funds are going away. That's part of why we are developing a plan. Right. I just am a little bit concerned that um, some of our legislators may not be aware how critical this source of funding is for for juvenile court services as, as they're thinking about funding for other other also necessary things. Absolutely, Madam Chair and, and Commissioner, when the, when the cigarette tax, when the Idaho Juvenile Corrections Act of 1995 was originally implemented, that's when those funds were put in there and it, it has been a while. So yeah, I'd absolutely be happy to do that. Thank you. All right, moving on. As you can see on the screen, our supplemental requests are spread across the general fund, the detention, <laughs> the Detention Clinician Grant and the Juvenile Corrections Act grant for a total request of roughly 119,000 in new funding. Of that, 113,352 would come from the general fund. Last year, with your support, we completed our career paths across the three divisions. There are 69 employees in those career paths. To progress on a career path, employees must express interest to their supervisor and develop a plan to meet specific goals um, for increased job responsibility, training, education, and in some cases, certification. Their progress is monitored throughout the year, so by the time we get to the budget process, we have a good idea of who will meet their goals this year. Uh, in fiscal year 2020, a total of 13 of our 69 Career Path employees are on track to meet their goals. Of those, five are detention officers, seven are probation officers, and we have one clinician. Did you say 39? 13. 13. For a total, six, 13 of 69, Madam Chair. Okay. For a total increase to the personnel budget of $11,200. Um, as you can see on the uh, chart, most of those are covered by uh, grant funds. Just as a reminder, the way the county budget system works, individual employees are assigned to um, a division within our department based on the funding source, so all the people funded through SIG are in one place. Um, uh, so 
grant funds cannot be used to fund promotions in the general fund. They have to stay in the area they are. And speaking of career paths, Madam Chair, I would like to give a shout out to Detention Supervisor Bill Dorsey, who retired last week after 37 years with detention. Um, he helped a lot of youth turn their lives around, and he has been featured. You may recognize his name. He's been featured several times th through the news for his music program, um, teaching juveniles to play uh, ukulele and uh, guitar. Um, to give you an idea of how important career officers are to us in helping these kids, I'd like to read to you one letter from several notebooks full of letters that Bill keeps uh, that he received from a juvenile, if you'll indulge me for just a minute. Absolutely. Dear Bill, I wanted to start off this letter by saying thank you. Thank you for seeing more in me than just a troubled team or a criminal. I have never really been a model student or a good kid, as they say. There came a point in my life where I had heard so many times that I am just going to die a gangbanger or end up in prison that I started to believe it. I started not to care about anything, really. My life, my family, school, sports, none of it. I learned one thing growing up in gangs. I learned how to tell when people are lying to me and being fake. A lot of the times my life depended on it. I learned how to tell when people are lying to me and being fake. Oh, sorry, skipped a line. When I came here, I instantly started liking you because I could tell you were real and actually cared. You weren't here to get paid, you were here to help. You taught me how to bring myself healthy joy. You taught me how to express my feelings without ever talking and just playing the ukulele. I really mean it when I say thank you. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for teaching me to play. And if I had a dad, I would want someone as cool as you. Madam Chair, Board, it's outstanding career employees like Bill Dorsey that help us change lives. I ask that you would continue to fund our career path this budget year to promote those. Moving on. In October 2017, the federally mandated staffing requirements of the Prison Rape Elimination Act, or PREA, went into effect. PREA requires that there be one officer for every eight juveniles in a particular area. Uh, earlier this year, a detention staffing analysis performed by Dr. Sorry, earlier in 2017, that year, a detention staffing analysis performed by Dr. Amy Herrig identified the need for a minimum of six new detention officer positions. Uh, I took the liberty of including that analysis packet in with the information that your clerk gave you this morning. The report gave two reasons for needing the new officers. First, to meet the federally mandated staffing requirements, and second, to increase our relief factor. That is, we need slightly higher number of officers than calculated to be able to meet our minimum staffing requirements because we need to have someone to cover absences. Uh, currently, we only allow, not counting sick, we only allow two officers to be gone at any one time on a shift. And unlike an office job, we cannot just call a temp agency. Our officers have to be post-certified, trained, uh, up to date in training and use of force, et cetera. Um, to cover absences, particularly uh, long-term if we can, but even call-ins, uh, we use a combination of temporary on-call employees and overtime. In 2017, we requested six new officers and were given three. Fortunately, our detention population dropped to historic lows uh, over seven, fiscal year 17 and 18, and we were able to meet our staffing requirements using our on-call staff whenever possible and asking existing officers to work overtime. However, starting last fall, our population almost doubled from the prior year's lows. Add to that a difficult flu season, two training academies, and a tight labor market, and we had more staff absences than we were able to fill. We relied heavily on our on-call staff and existing staff, but have been out of PREA ratio several times this fiscal year. The need for additional staff to increase our relief factor is clear. Our detention overtime budget is maxed out, and our on-call budget is well over budget. Uh, we'll be covering that with salary savings. It is expensive to routinely pay people 
time and a half to cover needed shifts. So whenever possible, we use our on-call staff, which is paid at straight time. Our population has since come back down to kind of average levels, but we still need to address our relief factor. We are asking the board to fund two new detention officer positions to help boost our relief factor for a total impact of 108,000 to the general fund. In conclusion, I've prioritized our two requests. We consider the promotion of existing employees to be our highest priority, followed by the need for the two new detention officers. Our current supplemental request is $115,646 with an additional $3,000 596 to be funded through grant resolution later in the year, which is why it doesn't quite match up with what Kathleen has. Those grant things are just tricky, Madam Chair. And with that, I am happy to stand for any additional questions. Thank you, Don. Appreciate that. Yeah. Any questions? That was an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just wanted to appreciate again um, the evidence-based best practices that you use. Um, over there at the center. I think that um, really helps us kind of track um, and the taxpayers that we are using uh, state taxpayers funds wisely and effectively. Um, also, if you could extend our appreciation to Bill for his service. Absolutely, um, Madam such Chair. Such a great mentor and he wants to volunteer anytime, right? <laughs> we are working on that, Madam Chair. Come back, great, thank and, you. And thank you and thank you to my staff. I work with a great group of folks who really care about kids and families. Yeah, thank and, you. And this board really cares too about the preventative, proactive diversion types of programs. It would be great at, at some time um, when a budget is presented and that category is stacked with more resources than the reactive categories. Madam Chair, we'll we look forward it. to the day we put ourselves out of business. Yes. <laughs> In the meantime, we'll work hard yes, in doing so. Thank you again. Yep. Appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Don. Thank you. Phil? Madam Chair, that wraps up uh, budgets for this morning. As I mentioned, we'll kind of do half days throughout the remainder of the week. Um, and then kind of I, one thing I would encourage, be thinking, you had mentioned during the break, we'll pull some resources together. But if any of you, uh, if there's any analysis or anything that we can be pulling together to help make the deliberative process easier as we get closer to that, please uh, let us know. Uh, Kathleen, myself, Anthony, the whole team are ready and available. Great. Thank right. you. Thank you. All right. Let's go into recess. I don't know what to do with all my extra stuff. I, can, I need like a separate folder. But.